the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is Forgiveness Sunday. It's the day uh, we also, on this day, remember the expulsion of Adam from paradise. We've got this gospel today. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I'm a tiny bit tempted, and obviously not going to do this, to just stop there. And then we can sit here for 10 minutes and let it sink in. The call is to forgive everyone everything. Forgive everyone everything. And as Elder Simeon Craigiopoulos says, don't twist the knife. When he says don't twist the knife, if you've read the anxiety book by him, he means that we'll, people will hurt us. And he kind of says that's their business. And then if we continue to like go over it and talk about it, gossip about it, worry about it, it keeps us up all night, that's us twisting the knife. Yes, they hurt us. And then what does the Lord say? If you forgive them, the Lord will forgive you. And if you don't, then he won't either. So again, today is called the expulsion of Adam for paradise. We'll spend Lent returning to paradise. The first step in doing that is forgiveness. We lament that Adam didn't ask for forgiveness and instead introduced a fracture between God and man. So you know the story, Adam and Eve in paradise. They're in the garden. Adam is given the job to till the soil because he made us hungry. It's like, mentioned a couple of weeks ago. God made us hungry. Hungry for him. You may eat of everything in the, in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is yours. It's all really good. I made it for you. Enjoy. The serpent, the devil, like, gets the serpent going. The serpent tempts Eve. The fruit on that tree of good and evil looks really good. Better than the others, maybe. And the Lord knows that once you eat of it, you'll be like him, because you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. You know, you'll have the gift, the discernment. You'll be like God. I'm not sure the devil's lying there. We wouldn't say he's lying. It's just the Lord said, as I mentioned last night at Vespers, you're not ready. You can't have it. What, for whatever reason, you can't have it. And the devil says, is that really what he said? You know. So Eve takes it and, and eats of it, gives it to Adam. Adam eats of it. He knows what's going on. And then the Lord goes for a walk in the garden. Adam, where are you? Because Adam was hiding himself, right? He had figured out he was naked because now his eyes had been opened because of that tree. He wasn't ready to have his eyes opened in that way. So he had shame now. He's hiding himself. He comes out and Adam and the Lord the Word of God, have a conversation. And Adam says that the woman you gave me gave me fruit from that tree. That's the fracture that didn't exist before. There was no division between God and man. There was no division between man and woman. There was no division. That it didn't start until Adam goes, it's kind of your fault that this happened. That's what he's saying, right? You did this because you gave me that woman. Not, I did this. And I'm really sorry I did this. Forgive me a sinner. Everything would be different if he had just begged for forgiveness and owned it himself. Extreme ownership. It's mine. I did this. Not somebody did this to me. I did this. So Adam is then expelled from paradise. We sang this last night, and we've been singing it this morning, but verily Adam for eating was driven from paradise. Wherefore he sat opposite thereto, wailing and mourning in a pitiful voice, saying, Woe is me, what hath befallen me, wretched man? And we hear him sing, I mean, we sing this for him, I transgressed one commandment of my Lord and was denied all kinds of good things. Wherefore, O most holy paradise, which for me was planted, and for the sake of Eve was closed, 
Implore him who made thee that I may contemplate the flowers of thy gardens. Therefore the Savior cried out to him, saying, I desire not the loss of my creation, but that it be saved. And come to the knowledge of thy truth, for thou cometh to me, I will not cast out. Adam goes into exile, and we are exiles also. We also don't ask forgiveness. We justify, like Adam did, we justify ourselves. We judge everyone for everything instead of forgiving everyone for everything. We have the healing fast before us, and we need to remember that Jesus fasted 40 days. The Spirit led him into the wilderness and he fasted. The church didn't dream this up. How can we mess up spring breaks, people's birthdays, you know? We'll take two months and we'll just kind of make it stinky. <laughs> or is the church saying, here's a gift. Let's give a tithe of the year back to the Lord. 10%. 365 days. I mentioned that Dorotheus of Gaza, whose book we'll start reading tomorrow. I hope you've got a copy of it. He like did the math on Lent. When you take out the Saturdays, which are their own special days, and Sunday's not a fast day, you add in Holy Week, and the week we just did, he says it's 36 and a half fasting days. It's exactly a tithe. That's Dorotheus of Gaza. To me, it looks like 50, but I'm going to stick with his math. Um, <laughs> we have the Spirit who can lead us also, like he led the Lord, and we can return to paradise. And we turn to paradise... We'll need to follow Christ in his actions. And what did Christ do? He fasted. By prayer and fasting, we'll be strengthened, and we need that strength. Without the Spirit of God, we're unable to do anything. Without the Spirit of God, we're most certainly unable to forgive. Yet, as soon as the living breath comes to us, we cannot help but forgive. When God's Spirit comes to us, it inspires within us mercy and compassion. We're moved to forgive and break all the earthly chains that bind us. We forgive so that when we sing during Orthros on Pentecost, our heart may be enlarged and receive the fiery, bedewed breath of the merciful Father. I'm going to read it again. This is from Pentecost. Our hearts might be enlarged and receive the fiery, bedewed breath of the merciful Father. The Father who ordained the forgiveness of our brothers, so that he might grant us the grace of adoption. We'll start Lent with forgiveness today. The right of forgiveness. I hope you'll stay. We'll forgive everyone for everything. Forgive me a sinner. They'll say it back. Forgive me a sinner. We'll both say God forgives. The next time, as I mentioned last night at Vespers, that we really talk about forgiveness, Christ will be on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If we have any other attitude about forgiveness, it's of the world and of the flesh and of the devil and not of the Lord. If we say, I'm not going to forgive everyone, a most, I'll forgive most, this is not of the Lord. We forgive and we get rid of that selfishness. We forgive and we offer repentance freely with peace. It's a, a sacrifice acceptable to God. It's part of being like in the priestly ministry. We first for our salvation, the whole world. We forgive and comprehend the judgment of the righteous and spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and he also takes away the sins of his enemies. Father, forgive them. Incredible. We forgive and thereby join ourselves to Christ. The same power, the same wisdom of the good news goes deep into our hearts and souls. We forgive and we open our hearts. As we will sing at Pentecost that I just read, our hearts will be enlarged. When we hold, withhold forgiveness, our hearts shrivel. This is it. It's just, it's a fact. We forgive and we're free of the poison and the bitterness and the demonic hatred that spreads throughout the whole world. We hate our own sins. Heaven opens up to us and declares the glory of God. Forgive everyone everything. Don't twist the knife. 
In Dostoevsky's great last work, The Brothers Karamazov, which is like the size of a dictionary and everybody's name is like, they, in Russia, you know, everyone's name, you have like a nickname and you have like a, a, the son of the father of Patroma, like you've got all these different names for the characters. So sometimes if you buy a copy of The Brothers Karamazov, it'll have a bookmark which will give everyone's like four names so you can figure out who in the world is talking, you know. In Brothers K, the story is told of Markel, the brother of Elder Zosima. He's diagnosed with TB. He's dying. And in his last days, he comes to a renewed faith in God, truly profound understanding of forgiveness. In a conversation with his mother, she wonders how he can possibly be so joyful in such a serious stage of illness. And I want you to listen to this. It's a, it's a paragraph, a conversation that Elder Zosima's brother, who's dying, is having with his mother. Mama, he replied to her. Do not weep. Life is paradise, and we are all in paradise, but we don't realize it. And if we did care to realize it, paradise would be established in the world tomorrow. And we all wondered at his words, so strangely and so relutely did he say this. We felt tender emotion and wept. Dear mother, droplet of my blood. He said at that time he had begun to use endearments of this kind. Droplet of my blood, unexpected ones, joyful one. It's very sweet. You must learn that the truth that each of us is guilty before all for everyone and everything. I do not know how to explain this to you, but I feel that it is so to the point of torment. And how could, they, how could we have lived all this time being angry with one another and knowing nothing of this? He spoke even about being guilty before the birds in all creation. Yes, he said, all around me there's been such divine glory. Birds, trees, meadows, sky, and I alone have lived in disgrace. I alone have dishonored it all, completely ignoring its beauty and glory. You take too many sins upon yourself, dear mother would say. But dear mother, joy of my life. I am crying from joy, not from grief. Why, I myself want to be guilty before them, only I cannot explain it to you. For I do not know how to love them. <laughs> Let me be culpable for all, and then all will forgive me, and that will be paradise. Am I in paradise now? And that's how the conversation ends. As difficult as it may sound, the reality described by Dostoevsky can be summed up very simply. My sins have corrupted the whole world. I want to make sure you hear this. This is the orthodox understanding. My sins have corrupted the whole world. My sins, Christ will go to the crossover. It did, he didn't need all of yours to do it. Mine were enough. And this is the way to understand it. We don't put ourselves... I mean, before you come to communion, you will say, I'm the chief of sinners. If you come to communion saying, I'm like a 75%. I'm like a C. You know? Or I'm like, I'm not as bad as... This, this, this is not the Christian way. The Christian way is to say, my sins have polluted the whole world. I'm guilty before the trees. I'm guilty before the birds and all the people and the Lord. And when we have Adam, woe is me that's befallen. I don't know if you caught this, wretched man. I transgressed one commandment of the Lord, was denied all kinds of things, good things. Wherefore, almost holy paradise. He's talking to the garden. Hey, garden which for me was planted and for the sake of me was closed. Implore him who made thee. He's telling the garden to talk to God and say, you know, take me back. The life of blame, recrimination, bitterness, anger, revenge, and the like are not the life of Christ. They're the raging of our egos and the false self. We need to be hid in Christ again. The life of forgiveness is the life of Christ within us. 
Who was waiting for St. Paul when he got to heaven? All of those he martyred. This is what forgiveness is. You know? And we might have in mind, hey, he killed me. I'm not forgiving him. You know? Like, that's kind of the ultimate sin against a person. Take their life. When St. Paul gets to heaven, it's not like he had to go, like, make amends. They'd already forgiven him. The question of forgiveness is not a moral issue. We do not forgive because it's the right thing to do. We forgive because it's the true nature of our life in Christ. As Dostoevsky described it, it's paradise. In the same manner, the refusal to forgive is a continuation of blame, recrimination, bitterness, twisting the knife, which creates a crisis because it actually drives us from Christ. Saint Zechariah, Saint Father Zechariah of Essex, not a saint yet, I don't know, maybe. Father Zachariah of Essex says, There is a further thought that's of great importance. Forgiveness and unforgiveness are not private matters. As Christ taught the apostles, whoever sins you loose or loosed, whoever sins you retain or retained. And this, of course, he says, has a particular meaning in the apostolic ministry of the church. This is how we understand the priest to be able to hear your confession as you come up, as you speak to the Lord, the priest is there. And what the Lord was saying to the apostles, whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Those you retain, they're retained. But Father Zechariah says it also alludes to another reality. The refusal to forgive is a force of evil in the world. And it binds. Both myself and others around me. It may not be an intentional binding, but bind it will. And he concludes, in the same manner, forgiveness is the introduction of paradise into this world. Whether I intend it or not, paradise comes as a fruit of the love of forgiveness. So I ask all of you, and we'll have the chance at the end of liturgy, but I ask all of you to forgive me for all of my sins and the ways I haven't served you well as a priest. <laughs> And you have to forgive me, because that's what I'm preaching about. So. <laughs> forgive everyone everything. What's the promise? Paradise. What is it if we withhold forgiveness? Hell. And we all know it. All of us probably have withheld forgiveness. Maybe you haven't. Some of you probably haven't. But enough of us have had that experience. I will not forgive that person. They have hurt me. You're Elder Simeon, you're twisting the knife. Forgive them. Don't keep recrimination. Don't keep bitterness. You know, don't do it. Paradise. May paradise consume us this day and every day of Great Lent. Like every day, put in the effort, keep the fast, do the prayers, come to church. Turn off, cancel Netflix. Save 16, 18 bucks a month, whatever it is. Cancel it. Don't sit at home watching TV. Go for a walk, play with the kids. You know, read a book, come to church, do your prayers. Let's capture, let's go back to the normal time, the regular time. Lent is not like the super special time, it's normal. We need it so desperately. And the way we start is forgiveness, and the joy of fasting. So may paradise consume us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.